Welcome to episode five of the Performance Advantage podcast with myself, Dr. Will O'Connor, and Matthew, Dr. Miller from MTV PhD. Matt, how are you going? What up? I'm going. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for having me. Um, I just had to stuff my face full of cake. Um, I had a good ride this morning. Uh, I was like, oh, I need to get back and catch Will. So we got to do this podcast. So I hustled back and um, didn't have time for a shower. Um, but, you know, here we are. Okay. That's what the people want to know. Yeah. That's all right. I have the rest of the day to take a shower. Um, so. so your uh, your first triathlon story was pretty popular last podcast. Yeah. Um, I, you know, for most of my friends, I thought I told them uh, about the triathlon story, but I got a lot of messages uh, last week um, that people <laughs> had heard my triathlon story. Um, yeah, it's true. So yeah, I yeah. nearly died. I thought I was dead. So I um, think you're, um, you sort of probably missed a career path there in storytelling. Uh, I got <laughs> quite a few comments saying that uh, you tell a story really well. But I mean, you were there. It was your life. Your yeah, I mean, eyes. it's easier to tell facts than it is to tell stories. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> it is what it is. <laughs> yeah. Um, so today, like last week, we we spoke about triathlon. And yep, that I was sort of more my area of expertise. Now we're going to get into your field. Training for, as part of the Training 4 series, Training for XCO, Cross Country Mountain Cycling. Yeah, I mean, if that's what you want to call it. Yeah. So, um, okay. So let's, XCO, that stands for Cross Country Olympic, right? So CC looks a bit silly. If you put, yeah, I race CC, <laughs> like carbon copy or I don't know. Canadian car. But um, yeah, lots of things. Um, let's stop it there. But um, XC is pretty standard for cross country these yeah. days. And then O is, stands for Olympic, so Cross Country Olympic. And that's just because uh, the particular discipline is an Olympic, uh, Olympic discipline. So mountain biking, cross country Olympic. So, yeah. yeah. Does the Olympic part pertain to like the duration? Because I know like if we go back, um, say a decade, uh, they were a lot longer. Um, the laps weren't super short. Like now you've got a lot more viewer friendly um, kind of scenario where you're going from, I don't know, what would you say an hour to an hour and a half around hour 15 yeah. to hour 30? Yeah, so I, I can't remember what the actual Olympic uh, guidelines are. I think it's somewhere between an hour 15 to an hour 30 is what they want the winner's time to be. Yeah. Um, and that is to make it a bit better for TV. And, um, you know, like, because the way it was, like, in the early 2000s and before that, you know, sometimes the races were three hours for, like, um, you know, either a World Cup or national level race, which is a pretty long time. So, like, if you want to spectate an event that lasts three hours, like, you really need to be pretty committed. Yeah. That's a long and, time. Um, like, and sort of, you know, going back to my field of triathlon, uh, we've seen the same kind of thing happening where, I guess, you know, with XCO, like, cross-country, mountain biking, it, it blew my mind when you introduced me to it. Live, free-to-air on Red Bull TV, this just like amazing quality HD. I don't know how many cameras, professional, um, you know, commentary and sideline interviews, all free to air, um, just absolutely enthralling content. And then I was, you know, converse, contrasting that to to a two hour triathlon, which sort of was a swim, which nothing really happened. And then a bike where something may happen, but it lasted for about an hour. And then a run where the fastest guys just ran away. And it was actually only a battle of like, I don't know, maybe three to six people, maybe 10. And then there was sprint distance, which is a lot more exciting, but still uh, just a condensed version of much of the same. Nothing really happening in the swim. Maybe a break on the bike, maybe a break, but generally not. And then a running race. Um so, whereas now, um, they've introduced a whole nother, I guess, realm of triathlon and Super League, which is that, um, like, 
you're doing multiple triathlons it's over multiple days they're very short distances there's very small fields um and they also have the team triathlon in the olympics now um, yeah that super league's really cool because uh we watched that together a bunch of times yeah um, yeah it's pretty fun to watch yeah it is like it's that continuous lead change there's um the smaller fields are meaning uh that you know it's just you you're you're enthralled there's a race that's that's happening amongst everyone um there's also the elimination factor of it uh but i digress like we're getting off of the topic of mountain biking but that is one thing i did want to bring up with cross country is especially at the world cup level the sheer number of people on the start line yeah yeah some I, sometimes they'll have 200 uh like the in the elite men's they could have 200 racers on the start line you know at least you know they they did and now you know you'll have at least 100 150 in europe um that's a lot of racers um to to be on a narrow track yeah well this uh, is the time. thing like if you'd said to me um i don't know five years ago with or even just three years ago with the, the way super league is now okay so we're gonna have 16 races and then by the last race of like an eliminator series there's gonna be six in the field i'd be like six people really like but then when i thought about it like i just said with the the olympic distance you end up waiting two hours or an hour and a half until the run where it's between three to six people anyway yeah that's just the nature of endurance sport really like you know? and so i was like oh now that there's only six people it's the best six people and the shorter distances allow like a lesser athlete to be able to be competitive um it is super super exciting um, yeah and yeah with the with the cross country i mean yeah there must be yeah 150 odd people but i can only name you know maybe 10 to 20 yeah um, and recognize their names when they're racing mm -hmm. yeah i mean it's still you know the best are the best and um you know the best riders start at the front and um since mountain biking it starts in a pretty wide um kind of starting corral if you will um but it really quickly it gets into single track and it's, it's called single track because you need to go single file pretty much most of the time um yeah. so you know the best riders are getting the best start but they're also the best anyway so they just kind of ride away for those two reasons yeah um, so the if we why don't you just take us through the whole sort of yeah we i guess we went over what what cross country is but the qualification process if you're interested in in cross country olympic yeah so i mean i think it's worth kind of defining cross country as um its own sport compared to like the other cycling kind of events um so like cross country you need to race you race for the whole time and you're going hard the whole time yep. and you do really short circuits that are like five to seven k long um, and you go up hills and you race down hills so you need to be really fit to go up the hills and you also need to be really fit so that you can recover on the downhills and the downhills are pretty technically demanding um and it didn't always used to be that way um but yeah they're pretty hard so you needed like a really high level of skill too um so you know if you want to be racing at the highest level you need to probably get some uci points to get yeah. to a world cup um and not everyone can get a uci point because uh, uh so uci is like the international governing body so you need to be at one of those sanctioned events to be able to even contest points probably in like your local kind of national level kind of thing yeah to be able to get one and then if you're lucky you can start at the back yeah yeah and so that's the that's the other thing once you get some points you are at the back of a hundred plus people yeah um so how are you going to get to the front like so what <laughs> i've seen is you start okay you start in this nice wide sort of you know single lane or two lane driveway kind of thing um or fire road or whatever you want to call it and then and then it either shoots up a hill or it gets into some single track after anywhere from 400 meters to a k um and as soon as that happens the guys at the front are riding and the guys at the back are or girls um are walking 
yeah, I remember that happening to me. Like uh, when we raced at Wyndham, um, you know, it was, um, yeah, it was pretty wide. And then within like two, three hundred meters, it had, it went into literally single track. So, you know, I was at the back. This was, uh, I don't know, this was like a national level race yeah. um, that we had pre-World Cup. And I was lined up at the back. And I could literally see, I looked up the hill, and, like, the leaders were, like, through the single track, riding up the ski slope. I was standing still. I'm like, well, I already lost one minute. We're not even two minutes into the race. I'm a minute back, standing here. And then, you know, like, and that's just how it is. But, you know, if I, you know, if I would have been, like, an awesome racer, um, I could have, you know, made some of that up, right? Because there's still plenty of opportunities to pass. And like, you're still kind of like you're racing more or less amongst your peers. So like you guys are all, or girls are going to like all kind of descend at a similar speed. So no one's going to hold you up massively on each descent. And then, you know, you have a climb and you're going to climb pretty much the same speed and you can kind of work your way through it. It's really hard to pass when you're like climbing at a similar speed because you need to really gas it. And yeah. go over your limit to pass so it actually it wears on you the more passes you make but um it's really important to be able to pass because um there's a thing called the 80 percent rule so if you're less than 80 percent of uh the leader's lap time or wh- whichever you're slower and it's within 80 percent i'm not sure how to explain it anyway but um uh, you get pulled from the race. So you come around through the start finish and you might finish, yeah. you might be like, oh, I only raced for 30 minutes and you're out. Yeah. You know, just because, you know, you've lost enough time that, um, and the laps are so short that eventually the leader's going to pass you. So yeah. they need to get you out of the way. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's um, the same sort of thing as uh, happening in triathlon. They're shortening up the courses, making them more technical. Um, and there's, there's just a lap out rule, um, where... Yeah, which is fair enough, really, like... It is, uh, on the bike, it is, you're just interfering with the race. Yeah. Then. Like, you still get not, a placing. You're, you're not in the race. Yeah, yeah, you still um, get a placing, though. So, like, um, you know, it'll say, like, minus three, you won't get a time for yeah. your race, but you will get a position, the position in which you finished. And, okay. Okay. you know, if you didn't move up enough, um in the like the first three laps well chances of you moving up you know 10 or 20 places in the next three laps they're pretty slim anyway so like you more or less finished where you were going to finish right ish yeah okay so that sort of actually makes more sense to me now that the way you'd be able to work up like if you're a really good racer let's say you're you've come from the um the the junior ranks like under 19 under 23 and you step up to a world cup and maybe you're down the back because of lack of points if you're really good even though you've stopped you're not going to win the race you're not going to get in the top 10 maybe even the top 20 but if you're at the back 120th then you're better than all those guys you still have an hour and a half to get past as many people as you can get past which is going to then push you up to you know yeah, and then you start moving. better next time. Yeah, yeah, and then you'll pass the same amount of people, and, and so you end up where you end up. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay. this is one of the problems, actually, um, and that's because, like, um, so especially, you know, riders in New Zealand, the fields in New Zealand are really, really good. Like, the top riders are really, really good, but, you know, they go over to a World Cup, and um, they're starting at the back. Yeah. Um, they're racing against their peers. Yeah. And... Um, you know, they might finish 80th um, just because it, it, it is hard to move up. Um, yep. So finishing 80th, I can tell you, it doesn't feel good. <laughs> you know, like no one wants to like spend all this money and go and finish, you know, at the back. Yep. But, um, you know, that just kind of is how it is. And it doesn't mean that they're not good. It just means that um, they need to do it again, right? So they need to race more big races and move up their starting position, get more practice um, and then kind of keep at it. But the problem is like you go and you get 80th, you know, three weekends in a row and you're pretty much, you want to go home and never race again. And I think that happens a lot. Yeah. But uh, yeah, because it's not um, a lucrative sport at that stage. 
Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, if you're getting 80th, you're probably you might be getting um, a bike uh, given to you to borrow for the year or something. You're buying tires, and you went through like a set of tires in the weekend, and you, yeah. you know you spent more money, and you you know you didn't make anything. Yeah, yeah, right, you're so. not, um, unless you have whatever governing body or, for the most part, like, no team or anything's picking you up at that stage. Um, so, like, you're, you're not on any retainer or anything of that kind of nature. So, in that sense, it, it's a huge commitment to try and move up. For, more so for, um, you know, New Zealand, Australia, um, probably South Africa as well, um, where we just don't have access to the proximity of races. Yeah, yeah, it's the same in the states too. Like the states is, is huge, yeah. but and um, like there's really talented fields, but there's also a limited number of UCI races. And it's the same thing. Like if you want to go to the biggest races where you really feel like you can prove yourself, like you need to get lots of points and travel around the U.S., make no money, and you know then eventually go to the to Europe um, where you feel like you can prove yourself and, you know, start an 80th or whatever. Yeah. Um, Is it's that what you did? Still... How did you, what was your whole situation? So when I was racing? Yeah. Yeah. So when I was racing, I was racing in the national kind of level field yeah. and I was, you know, still getting smoked, yeah. you know? <laughs> um, so the, the fields were pretty deep and the top riders were some of the top riders and, yeah. um, you know, I'd finish a couple laps down and that's just, it is what it is. Uh, but we have a lot more racing that we can do. So when I was racing, I was able to do lots of local races and kind of, uh, you know, earn my way through doing that kind of thing. And there's value in even doing local races when you get 600 people showing up. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, you can still get um, equipment support and stuff like that, even doing local races there. And that's the one benefit that we have in the States um, compared to New Zealand, where... Um, they're smaller fields, so, you know, if you're getting, uh, you know, if you're outside kind of the top 10 or whatever, um, there, there's not a huge value to kind of offer support to that person because there's only, you know, 40 or 50 other riders or maybe 100 other riders that you can kind of be an advertising tool for. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 And New Zealand as a whole is so, like, you're always going to turn up to the same sort of races. It's like, if I'm going to advertise on someone, I want to advertise on the winner. Yeah. Or the, the top five kind of people, um, because they're going to be at all the races. It's not like in the States where, you know, so you're from uh, Pennsylvania, like, oh, I want to advertise on that guy. He might be coming 10th, but he's going back to a whole different network of riders. Um, yeah. Whereas in New Zealand, like, you might be going back to three other riders. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's changing though in New Zealand because like mountain biking is just huge. It's just constantly growing in New Zealand. The... I live in Rotorua, man. I'm... Well, you're in the mecca. You're yeah, in the we're... mecca of mountain biking. I, we just there's another bike shop opened. I don't know how many. There's more bikes. I think the only thing we have in Rotorua is bike shops and cafes. And yeah, but you know the problem. One problem in Rotorua is that if you're up at seven a.m. You there's only one place you can go to get coffee, unless you go to to the gas station. It's Zippy's. Nothing else seems to be open on seven a.m. on a Saturday. Okay, well I have yeah, to so find that's that a problem. Out for you. Can um, you put in a good word for me? <laughs> yeah, well, I've got, <laughs> got my own coffee machine, so <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know how it is. It's uh, yeah. That's how locals roll. Yeah. So like, you, yeah, you guys have just uh, there's so much mountain biking there. Um, so I think it is growing, and I think like the level of support is kind of changing a little bit um, in New Zealand, just because so many people do it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so if we, that's sort of how, I guess we go back to the qualification process and what cross country is, that's the process. Now, if you're training a rider, so particularly with uh, cross country, New Zealand just had the cross country nationals over the last weekend. Yeah. Um, and you coach uh, one of the junior riders who's been moving through the ranks, and he's he was third. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, in the in the national under under nineteen or twenty three. Under nineteen, yeah. Under nineteen, yeah. And then also our close friend uh, Samuel Shaw. 
yeah, uh, yeah. Was, was third as well in the um, open men's race. Elite men, yep. Yeah, yeah. And you've worked closely with him as well over the years. Um, so how how do you get to that level? I seem like yeah. I feel like you're the guy, right? MTB PhD. Yeah, well, I mean, this is, you know, mountain biking. I studied it and I've raced a lot of them. I've worked with a lot of athletes. Um, I've looked at like lots of power files, you know? So like, that's my day job is I look at power files for mountain bike racing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah, let's talk about it and like what we need. So um, like, we kind of talked about the start just before and um, like Why everyone break put... down, break down the race. Like what am you know, I'm guessing a lot of people have probably started with their road cycling or they can understand road cycling. When, when we're looking at, at mountain biking, cross country mountain biking, what are, what are our defining factors um, within the race? Like there must be three or four um, decisive p- parts of the race. You got the start. Yes. Okay. Let's start with a start because I do not think in any way the start is decisive. Um, so you when got you're a big group of people, you got 150 yeah. people. You yeah. can't tell me you can just like casually cruise off the line. No, no. But Especially I can't. if you're in the front few rows, you yeah. Stay in the front few rows. That's going to require yeah. some ridiculous effort at the start. Okay, it, it's a pretty big effort. So um, most riders at the start of the race are going to throw down like 1,500 watts um, to, to just get off the line, get going, and then not get into the single track in a really bad position. Yeah. Right? So um, because while you can't necessarily um, win at the start, um, you can definitely lose it, and that goes um, that goes two ways, um, losing the race at the start. So the first way you can lose the, the race at the start is by um, going too hard. Okay. So we talked about pacing before. Um, this was actually before we did podcasts. Um, we talked about pacing. We're going to do another podcast on it. <laughs> but um, you need to go hard. But you can't blow up because if you go as hard as you possibly can for one minute, and if you've ever done that, you know exactly how you feel afterwards, yeah. and you feel like you need a nap and a burrito, yeah. right? Like, and you're not. So you need to remember that you still have an hour and a half to continue racing, and to keep going hard. So yeah. you can 100% lose the race at the start by going too hard. The other way you could lose the race at the start is by um, kind of not going hard enough. And um, this is more for um, if you're fighting for the win, right? So you, you need to be at least close to the leader at the start if you want to fight for the win. For everyone else, just stay within your limit and try and minimize what you lose at the start. Um, yeah. And just kind of settle into a steady rhythm that you can kind of maintain. But, you know, if, if the leader rides away um, and you guys are you know, if you get stuck behind a bunch of riders, the leader rides away and you suddenly lose 30 seconds and your peers, right, you're equal of nearly equal ability, it's going to be hard to make 30 seconds up unless they blow up. Yeah. Yeah, right. So although outwardly or, you know, looking at it, I guess from an uneducated eye, it looks like everyone's just going as maximal as they possibly can. Yeah. But what's happening is the front guys are the front, all girls are the best athletes yep. so they are going hard and they're going relatively as hard as you are it's just that yeah potentially if you're not in the front um you don't need to be going as hard as them you need to be you know you don't need to be up the front with them you need to be within your peers well yeah because the guys the the racers at the front aren't going over their limit they're going over your limit which is yeah. something that you can't maintain um, but they're not going over their own limit. They're not dumb, you know? Um, so if, uh, anyone has watched the world cups, uh, from a couple of years ago when Julian Absalon was like way like, you know, 20th at the start, it wasn't because he was bad at starting. It was because he was smart and he yeah. would work his way up. Um, but you know, you see the other riders that kind of 
go over their limit at the start, and then they move back as Julian Absalom moves forward. Yeah. Um, so, because they went over their limit while he didn't. So yeah. That's important. That's really important because you need to keep racing. It's not yeah. over at the start. Just because you're you're leading at, in the first lap doesn't mean you're going to win. Yeah. Yeah. I, so are you training? You need to train for that though, right? Yeah. You can't just be really, really fit but expect to throw down a thousand plus watts. Yeah. And yeah. not, you know, put you in bed with a burrito. Yeah, that's right. Because especially, it might be hard to find a burrito. That could be a problem. But um, yeah, so like you, when you start and you start with a massive sprint, you're gonna generate a lot of lactate that you that's kind of gonna be circulating around and lots of um, hydrogen ions and a lot of you know acidity in the muscle. Yeah. Um, and it's not over then. Like you need to keep going. So you need to kind of train to be able to. Uh, use that lactate and convert it to energy while still going relatively hard. Yeah. Right. And that's really important. And that, you know, so if you train for a start, you go really, really hard for a short amount of time, and then you go really hard for quite a long time. Right. So that that's one kind of interval session you can do to train for a start. But those are really, really taxing. So you yeah. can't be doing that all the time. I can imagine because it's, um, yeah, you're really having to target on the, acidic buffering capacity yeah. of, of the muscle yeah. while working still above probably um, lactate threshold. Yeah, it's it's a VO2, it's a, you know, kind of an all-out sprint and then a VO2 max effort. Yeah. Um, which, it just drains you. You can't do those all the time. But that's the kind of thing that you kind of need to do to be able to, to um, you know, be able to cope with the start. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and not all the time, like one or two of those, like in the build up to the race is enough. Yeah, so. yeah. Well, you have to be able to um, go hard enough to make it a worthwhile session. You can't be doing it when you're sort of, you know, in amongst like a huge volume. No. Or something like that, no. right? No, but and like the other thing you need to, like, because you do that really, really hard workout to train to be better at starting, starting's not that important. Um, in terms of the rest of the race. So, like, actually, you still need to be kind of training when you kind of mix, like, you add one of those sessions. You still need to train because, really, when we look at mountain biking, the very most important thing that you can do is be aerobically fit. Yeah. And um, it goes for mountain biking as a whole. Yeah. I mean, it goes for any kind of biking sport. It's like, um, and people will argue this, but, yeah, aerobic fitness is number one. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay, so we get, we get through the start and that is actually a lot more simplistic than, than I thought, um, because you're right, it, it doesn't seem to actually impact the race that much. It only does if you are thinking, oh, I need to train more for the start, but what's probably happening is you're just going too hard and it's not a matter of lack of training. It's a matter of overexerting yourself. Yeah. Uh, Far more common than anyone would ever imagine. Until they throw a power meter on their bike, um, they're not going to actually understand what's going on. The the same happens uh, in swimming for for triathlon. Like, you know, everyone thinks they need to be in the front pack, and then you break down the times because the swimming is is almost impossible to measure. Um, like, just the GPS doesn't work in water. Um, you know, accelerometers, uh, it's hard to monitor on like a um, horizontal plane, things like that. It's so hard to gauge effort, but you also need to be near the front, but you don't need to overexert yourself when the best swimmers are just like swimming so casually. Um, yeah. It's, yeah, it, it's exactly that. Like it's not a matter of like needing to be at the front, it's needing to not, to minimize your effort. Yeah. Um, anyway... So then how are you, now the, the rest of the race is so unique to endurance sport and that, yeah, hill climbing, like we can all sort of understand you need to be light and powerful and fit. But then on the other side of that, you've got a, you've got a descent that may have small sprints in it. It may have, you know, um, it obviously has some level of technicality, coordination, 
um, bike handling, like all of the stuff you can't do if you've just reamed yourself up a hill. Yeah, no, you you can't. Like in, um, in the Tour de France, right? You see these guys and girls climb. Well, not girls in the Tour de France, but in cycling, they'll they'll put in, you know, try and break the group up once they get up to the top. Um, as long as they've got enough of a gap, they'll sit up, take a drink. You know, they'll be hooning down the other side. They might zip up, put on a, a vest or s grab some more fluids and stuff. Um, that's just not happening. No, in mountain biking, like, um, like you, you need to go quick down the hills. And there's no time for rest. And this is actually what makes it, it's one of the things that makes it unique to other cycling uh, to, you know, compared to road cycling is that, yeah. like, you go up the hills really hard, but then when you go down the hills, you have no time for recovery, really. Um, so your best opportunity to recover is to kind of remove pedaling, because this is kind of your chance to uh, to not pedal. Like, it's your only chance to really not pedal. Um, yeah. And But down. you, on the downhills, yeah. yeah. So, you know, coast as much as possible. Um, and, you know, if you're if we have highly skilled riders, they're able to kind of go down um, big parts of a descent at the highest speed possible without adding pedaling. So that maximizes the recovery they can have for the next uphill. Okay, cool. So then what? how are you trying to incorporate, like, what's most important? Like, if I'm, I'm, I'm a fit guy, I want to do some, some mountain bike racing, um, I have actually. Yeah. Oh, that race is so hard. Oh man. Well, you I did two, so why don't you tell us about the two that you did? Um. Well, one. So the first one was on a hardtail. Yeah. And. Uh, I guess I went out hard, but I knew from talking to you and just from endurance sport in general. Like I was like, I just need to be in a good position going into the single track, right? And. And then it just didn't let up. It was like this new, a lot of, especially in ultra endurance, um, marathon running, like Ironman triathlon, half iron, like it's all very like controlled and consistent. Um, even like a 5K or 3K running race, you're not sprinting at any point unless it's the end um, or to slightly get around someone. Um, it's very a consistent effort. Uh, Whereas this was like, I was just, I was going hard and then I was sprinting and then, you know, cause you, and then I was getting on the brakes and then I was having to get back on the bunch that I was riding with, like get back on the wheel and then they would make a mistake and then I'd put the brakes on and then I've got to speed up. Um, it was like this, I was just absolutely wrecked after, I mean, yeah, I had to, I had to very soft pedal at home after <laughs> i think it was maybe i think it was three laps it was about an hour 20 or so after 40 minutes i remember wondering if i could even finish <laughs> like i was just that spent it was it was so unique um that and that being on the hardtail on so the the course we did was in the the santo forest which is uh, a beachside forest so it's kind of sandy not hugely hilly quite technical very undulating rolling um you know pinch hills and and corners and soft sand and so it's it's a you need to be going pedaling on the pedals the whole time very rooty so with the hard tails jumping around um it was yeah it was just it was a screw shot i didn't like it um but i went back i went back to the same race which is maybe a month later i had a new bike full suspension bike um and i started a bit easier and tried to control myself i thought um what is it S yeah relax is smooth and smooth is fast yeah slow is smooth and smooth is fast that's what phil dumpy says so that was what i was thinking and i tried to you know i was able to um finish a lot stronger um, if I didn't happen to go the wrong way, I think I might have been you, Matt. Mm. Uh, it was going to be a close race. I had a good yeah, start. I think so. And uh, it was, yeah, once I understood the sheer level of accelerations and huge power outputs that were required just in, in like, my sort of, you know, amateur 
state, which is actually going to be more exaggerated because I'm not as smooth. Um, but I think, yeah, sorry, that was my... Yeah, that's good. That's a good story. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, once I... I guess because I was trying to exercise at the level, you know, I knew I could maintain for an hour and a half, as a, which is quite a high level. Um, but then when you have to add all those sprints um, and accelerations on top of that, that level it then becomes a lot less. Like yeah. You know, your your sustained average, like your average power compared to your normalized, I guess. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I. I, I remember um, how wrecked you were from from that first event, and because uh, I took my hardtail out for that same event, yeah. I, I rode my dirt jump bike, and I was like, oh yeah, th- I think this thing would be pretty mean at uh, XC, you know, because I'm I'm at the right height where I can get, you know, if I put a really long seat post in, I can race my dirt jumping bike yeah. in cross country. So I was like, sweet, 26 inch hardtail, but um, <laughs> both of our backs were absolutely wrecked. Oh, like I was wrecked for days actually. Yeah. Like, um, you know, small wheels, <laughs> never having <laughs> raced it in a really, really long time. And um, I just, hardtails are just too rough. Like, you really need to develop um, a different kind of racing, like, mus- like the muscles that you use to race a hardtail are just different. And that doesn't suit my style yeah, of well, you, uh, going hard. Yeah, well, you put accelerometers on different body parts. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So we did this uh, this kind of research, and um, yeah, we we used accelerometers, and it was kind of all over the bike. Uh, we had some at the handlebars, some at the seat, and um, you know, some at, on the body, right? So what's happening is like w- what we were trying to measure is um, where these accelerations are dampened, because if you kind of just had a rigid body bouncing around a trail, um, and that was you as a rigid body, your brain would shake so much that you'd probably be dead at the bottom of a descent, yeah. right? Um, but um, what's actually happening is the bike's shaking a lot and vibrating a lot and taking these impacts, and then our legs and our arms are damping those impacts, so our head pretty much doesn't shake at all. Um, yeah, yeah. I remember that was, um, yeah, I found that really interesting. You had the ex- accelerometers on the head, and it pretty much doesn't move. Yeah. Whereas your arms are obviously, the, you know, jackhammering yep. so are your legs um to ensure and so that what that was just to ensure your brain didn't smash against your skull yeah well yeah because like your brain's kind of uh, like with suspended within a bit of fluid right and yeah. um that's why you don't shake a baby right so like you <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly why because yeah per, you know permanent like brain damage right um and that's exactly why we our bodies adopt this strategy this autonomic strategy, we don't even think about it when we're mountain biking. And we do all this damping to protect our central nervous system. Um, But what's happening, like the issue with that, and this is where it's different from road cycling, is that um, all this this autonomic strategy, this thing that we do without even thinking about it, uh, by using our arms and our legs to dampen the vibrations to our head, is that costs energy. Yeah. Right, so we go up a hill really hard when we're mountain biking, and then we go down a hill as fast as possible. Yes. But since we're using all those extra muscles to go down that hill to dampen those vibrations, we have that reduced recovery. Yeah. So our heart rates don't actually get a chance to go down um, to the level that we're actually of the work that we're doing with our legs, our power yeah. output. Yeah. So our heart rates just reduce a little bit because we're doing all this work with our arms yeah. and our legs. Okay, and that's the that's the difference between hardtail and, and full suspension. Uh, yeah. So like, uh, people that spend a lot of time on a hardtail um, get yeah. pretty good at descending on a hardtail. Okay. Um, so actually, like the vi- the level of vibrations isn't hugely different. Um, when you take away a rear shock. Yeah. The main difference with a hardtail is that you actually have to stand so much, because. Uh. So if you, um, and it's, uh, you know, it goes both ways, like on a climb and a descent. So like if you go up a bumpy climb um, and, you know, your back tire is about to hit that a root. That was actually one thing I did notice was the back wheel stayed on the ground so much more. Yeah, you that's know, exactly sit, what you want. Sit through the roots, the tree roots. Um, and this is what I've recommended, you know, the, the, the Xterra guys. Um, 
to to use full suspensions because you can't afford you know when you got to run off the bike you, you can't afford to be standing up that's right yeah and like and that's not just on flats and it's not just on descents that's on climbs too so yeah. if you're about to your rear wheels about to hit like a route that's you know maybe four or six you know 10 inches off the ground or whatever to get that over you can't just sit and pedal and plow through it like yeah. you need to slightly raise like your butt off the seat right otherwise it's going to shake your back kind of hurt your back and it's going to also shake your head so your body doesn't want that at all so what we end up doing is standing up yeah and um you know if you like you know wherever you are now if you like stood up and you squatted halfway stood up all the way squatted halfway stood up and squatted like that takes extra energy yeah so yeah. that yeah <laughs> Right? Like, you'd get tired of doing that after a while. Now, add into that going as hard as you can for an hour and a half. Yeah. And damping these massive impacts. Um, so, yeah, like, uh, that's where I see the drawback of hardtails is mostly on the climbs. Okay. It's interesting because most people would think it was that was where the benefit was. Yeah. Well, they're not that much lighter. Like, not these now, days, right yeah, these days, like, a full suspension bike might, like, cost an extra kg. Yeah. Um, which like, like None it of the isn't climbs that, much. Are that big, really? Are they? You no, know, that's gonna matter. That is gonna matter a lot over half an hour. Yeah, if you have a half an hour climb. Yeah, that's what I mean. But yeah. A lot, them, um, a lot of them, I'd say the, the what you lost in the um, climb, if you you know had a kg heavier bike, you'd probably be able to make up in the descent, quite possibly from saved energy. Yeah, or even just take into account a bumpy 30-minute climb versus a smooth 30-minute climb. Yeah. You know, if you could sit the whole time, that, that's quite good. You don't need to use that muscle, the musculature to support your body mass. Yeah. You can just sit in the saddle, which is mm. quite good. Yeah. Okay. So then what, how are you, how are you training these guys? What my question was before uh, we we got into my uh, mountain biking, extensive mountain biking experience, mountain bike racing experience, yeah. um, was where's, where, where, where should I be training? Like, I'm, I'm quite fit. Should I be focusing on... So I'm aerobically fit. Let's say I've got the perfect base. Now is it should... Do I need to worry about climbing or the other kind of short, high-intensity stuff? Um, or should I just be like... I need to get as skilled as possible. Yeah. Well, I think where most people are going to be falling short is the kind of working on the right kinds of fitness. So oh, for yeah. you to go into mountain biking, like you're a fit guy, you do a lot of running, you do the odd mountain biking, and like you, you've ridden bike plenty. So yeah. you're going into it pretty fit, and you can pretty much, if you're on the right bike and you pace it properly, you can pretty much cope the, with the demands of cross-country racing. Yeah. Like you, you, you should be fine. But... Um, but you train aerobically, right? So you, you have the engine. Yeah. Whereas, you know, people will look at a mountain bike race and say, yep, you need to go hard up a climb. So I'm going to go hard up climbs over and over and over and over. Yeah. And they'll do lots and lots of intervals. Yeah, I see that um, in the forest uh, a lot. And I'm like, am I missing something? Like, is that, do you need to be... Um, it was the same when I was down in Palmerston North with you because the, the mountain bike park is just on the side of a hill and um, there's always people smashing themselves up the hill. Like, is that is that really important? Uh, I'd say the very most important thing that you can do to get better at cross-country mountain biking is to build your engine aerobically. Okay, so, so that's what um, this Caleb uh, Botcher, who the third under he went to world champs right so yep. like that level of rider um how's how like how many hill efforts is he doing uh we might get like two hard rides in a week yeah maybe three um and how many times is he riding uh most days okay yeah and most of it's aerobic okay. um so you know he's Especially when you're younger and kind of starting out, you, the, the focus should kind of be on the engine. Um, and uh, so that's, that's what we spend most of our time doing because, like, if you ride at an aerobic pace, you can ride. 
at an aerobic pace pretty much every day and feel yeah. pretty good, which means that you can get actually, you can get more volume in um, and you can get, um, you know, the idea is that you can get more adaptation aerobically. And, um, you know, I think this kind of goes against what everyone thinks about when they look at mountain biking because you do go so hard and you're so out of breath on every single hill that you do. But what we need to do is we need to take a step back and look at the power output that we're actually putting out. Um, okay. So, yeah. so, and, you know, that's, you, when you do that, you can really see the energy systems at work. And if you understand how the energy systems work, you can understand how to train, right? Okay. So um, if we kind of drew a level right here, right at my mouth, and we went across the screen, and this okay, is so, my... So, so more like a line across the screen. Yeah, we, yeah, yeah, flat line. That's my... That's my lactate threshold, yeah, right? So flat line. Yeah. Flat line, totally straight line because we know what our lactate threshold is. So, and then, you know, I'll start over here at this end of the screen because this is um, the left as I'm looking at it. So I'll look at the start of the race, right? I'm going to draw it with my finger. And if you're not yeah, watching really it on the... really helpful for a podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you, you know, this is pretty easy to picture. So we have this level across my... My mouth, it's a graph. mid level. So yeah, it's a, a graph with a okay. line halfway across it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so we have that straight line, and we do the star, and you know we're we're quite a bit above my mouth, my head, uh, above that line, right? So we're going quite hard, but yes. then what happens is this power output goes back down to zero on you know that first descent, and you have like thirty seconds at zero. So that yeah. real that first effort was really really hard. Then what yeah. we have is we might have a, the next climb, and we might kind of get uh, a little bit above our lactate threshold. Yeah. Right? And then we kind of bounce around like that for a while, for a couple minutes up that climb. We're slightly above our lactate threshold. Yeah. And then we drop back down to zero on the descent. So it's intermittent, right? That's what we'd call it. We'd call it intermittent. Um, and what we need to be able to do intermittent activity, which is hard rest, hard rest, hard rest, we need the highest level of aerobic efficiency that we can get. Yeah. Um, so, um, so that's our lactate threshold. That's the highest level of our aerobic ability. And that's yeah, yeah. the area that we need to work on the most to be able to repeat these sprints over and over and over. You might have a sprinter that can sprint really, really, really hard for 30 seconds and blow everyone's doors off. Yeah. But after that, they're going to need that nap and that burrito, right? Yeah, because yeah, right. they're a sprinter. Yeah. Right. And that's not what we do in mountain biking. What we do in mountain biking is um, we go pretty hard for an hour and a half. And we're always breathing really, really hard because we didn't get a chance to recover on the descent. Yeah. But a lot of the um, ventilatory stuff is driven by the excess CO2 um, generated from the anaerobic effort. Yeah, that's um, right. Because the, it's, not, it's not so much how hard you're trying that generates ventilation. Um, it's actually the concentration of CO2 in the blood that we're trying to excrete through our lungs and our mouth. So it's not so much the need for oxygen, it's the need to get rid of yeah. um, carbon dioxide. People sort that's... of miss that, um, I think, a lot of the time. Yeah. Which, so that's why a lot, you, know, you can be going down a descent breathing really hard um, because they're, you, you've tried really hard up the hill. Yeah, um, yep. yeah, because still... we start to generate CO2 as well, just from, you know, using glycolysis and buffering uh, hydrogen, right? Yeah, so yeah, buffer which is acidity. on the descent. It's a lot different to just sitting, like, on a road bike and, and rolling down the hill. Mm. Um, okay, so now I'm starting to get, yeah, when you look at mountain biking, you think, man, they, they're going hard for, for like, um, and even when you do the sport, like, having done a couple races, it feels like you're going hard the whole time. Um, but what's when we take a step back, like you're saying, you understand that actually it's not so much how hard can I go, it's how fast can I recover from those hard efforts. Yes. And I don't need to be, you know, be able to put out 500 watts to do that. I need to be able to recover from putting out 500 watts. Yeah, and again, to be able to put out 500 watts again. Yeah, 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 I see, I see. Um, but then you must have to, like... So you know how, how I train, like I'm training for marathons, ultra marathons, um, you know, running, um, 
100, 140Ks a week, predominantly aerobically, so my aerobic engine is, is very large. Um, but then I wasn't, let's say I had pasted appropriately, um, although I didn't, I was probably going too hard. I was not that well equipped to handle those surges. Now right. you must have to train hard to do that. Yeah, yeah, and we do, we do. Um, so and is those one of those two hard sessions you do in a week? Yeah, 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 yeah. So what we need to, like, if we're going, if we're exercising above our lactate threshold, we're recruiting, you know, some a lot a lot of muscle fibers. Like, yeah. and a lot of them are going to be type 2 muscle fibers that we don't really recruit when we're exercising aerobically. Yeah. Um, so we're definitely going to be working on some in, intermittent, like, really hard sprints uh, or really hard VO2 max efforts just to recruit those muscles and work on those energy systems because we definitely need them, yeah. right? Because we're going to be going yeah, hard yeah. and we just yeah. need to look at, like we know we're going to exercise at times above our lactate threshold. Um, so we need to we need to be able to do that really. And um, uh, so yeah, we're going to throw in some hard efforts. But the issue is like they're so hard um, that we, we can't do them all the time. And that's, that's the main thing. So, like, I'm not, like, a pr huge, like, I'm not a preacher of never go hard. I'm, I'm more of a preacher of um, when you go hard, go hard. And the rest of the time, keep training and by riding easy. So that way you yeah, can so hit those hard sessions harder. approach. Yeah, which I think, uh, I yeah, I mean, I don't know what the name used to be, like, if it's all, always been called that. But, you know if you're sprinting every day, like the quality of your sprints is just going to go down and down and down as those two, type two fibers get more fatigued, you know, cause they'll get, they'll be more fatigued tomorrow and more fatigued the next day. Yeah. So um, there's no point or like period of adaptation. Yeah. Like you need to rest to adapt. Yeah. Um, so if I'm, um, or anyone, so the people out there, they're not, they're not going to be elite athletes. Um, majority of them, and they're wanting to do uh, some cross-country mountain biking for fun and a bit of racing and stuff. Like, is it worth them doing any hardy fits, or should it all just be easy sort of training where they can also couple that with improved skills? Yeah, this is probably where you'd take another step back and look at what, like, you'd look at two things, and probably the first thing would be to look at how much time they have available. Okay. Um, to yeah. actually train. So some people might only have like four hours a week or something yeah. like that. Um, and then, you know, so other people might have unlimited time. Uh, but okay, you so then... Let's, let's go for um, very restricted time. I can train three days. Yep. And then we'll have someone with a, a more like an hour to an hour and a half each day. Yeah. Okay. Why so don't you sort you... of contrast those? I think those are the sort of two that I've come across in terms of, um, you know, training available time. Yep. Okay. So, um, if you can train an hour and a half each day, you might want to throw in like probably three of those hard ish sessions, maybe a VO two max session, maybe a repeat sprint session. Three. And that sounds like quite a lot. Maybe three. I don't know. I, what do they need? <laughs> I don't know much about this person. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so, okay, let's go with two, because that's what Will says, um, or <laughs> what Will wants. So if we do two hard sessions, maybe a VO2 max session and, like, uh, maybe a sprint session if we need to work on that, but probably more like uh, like a lactate threshold kind of session. Okay. And the rest would be kind of easy ride, like aerobic zone two kind of riding. Yeah. Um, um, for an hour and a half race, are you needing to do, how long would someone need to do a long ride? Well, um, you know, if we have someone that has only an hour and a half on each day, um, then we might look at doing like a fasted ride. So they kind of yep. wake up in the morning, don't eat breakfast, get this ride in before work and get as much adaptation that they can from this aerobic session. There's their hour and a half for the day. Done. Um, if you can get in the longer rides, that's probably a little better because you can add a little bit more stress to the aerobic yep. system. Um, just through duration that you can't do in one and a half hours when you yeah. say easy riding yeah um because of the nature of a bike um and it's supporting you 
like you can go ridiculously easy. Yeah. I'm sure you've seen those people biking to work with a cadence of about one every yeah. minute. Um, Are they on e-bikes though? <laughs> potentially. Um, but you know, like you can go very, very easy on a bike. Um, I, is there a limit to how easy you can go? Yeah, probably. Like you, uh, like we do like a recovery session, like this odd recovery session when we need it. Um, and when I uh, prescribe one of those, that in the instructions, like I kind of say, it should just feel like your legs are just falling down, yeah. right, with each pedal stroke. Like you're not really going to get much adaptation from your legs just falling down at 90 yeah. RPMs. Yeah, um, yeah. You're not really demanding much from the muscle. Like they're important sometimes just to, for active recovery, but um, if you're looking for adaptation, that's a bit probably too easy. Um, okay. But maybe you know, you yeah. So above that, are you yeah. using a are you mon like are you prescribing a heart rate or a percentage of power or? Yeah, yeah. We we can prescribe aerobic training by either of those. Yeah. Yeah, but what do you do? <laughs> well, you, not everyone has a power meter. Like, if I start working with an athlete, I say the very best investment you can get is a power meter. Uh, but, yeah. you know, it's for some people, it's out of budget. Um, some people kind of uh, you just don't want a power meter. Um, yeah. So if they don't have one, then we do heart rate. And that's yeah. heart rate would always be second to training with power. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, so... What else? Skills. The skills yeah. component. How is someone going to work on that? I mean, it's it's a really hard one to to actively train for, I feel, because if you have bad skills, you can't just go ride a hill a whole bunch of time. You'll get a little bit better, I'm, I'm guessing, but you've picked up those bad skills maybe due to a lack of knowledge or something. How do you get better at that? Yeah. Well, I've done some skills coaching, and um, um, like that was maybe ten years ago that I was doing some skills coaching, and uh, I thought you did that stuff, you know, that um, squad. Yeah, yes, we did. Um, okay, that, that actually, that yeah, ago. no, that wasn't okay. So I've done this a lot actually. <laughs> um, uh, so I've done like on trail kind of skills coaching, and I've done like for the local club, I've done like. Help, helping to for riders to kind of get some technique and like do some things in a really nicely controlled way on a field. So yeah. that's what I've done. But actually, um, skills coaching in the last five, ten years has really become like its own thing. Like there are specialized skills coaches and there are specialized um, like skills training programs um, that riders can do to really get a good handle on like just handling the bike better yeah um so it's it's advanced far beyond what i have done um and uh like riders see results so when i work with riders and i like even this is like high level um enduro racers you know that are winning winning races um i always recommend like a skills coach just to kind of like help take them to the, the next level because I, what i do is i'm a fitness coach and like yeah. I can look at your power file uh, from a race and I can tell like, I can see exactly what you need to do to get better at mountain biking. Yeah. Like at, for fitness wise. Yeah. But you know, I do a lot of that remotely and I can't have someone like go out and do drills in a field, like turning around a cone in the grass, yeah. you know? And for me to like have someone do that over and over, um, and you know, us think it's going to work. I think that's a bit of a disservice when you can like hire a proper skills coach to like help you dial in your skills if that's what your limiter is. Okay. And like I've seen these things pop up on my social media, um, these online kind of courses. And also, you know, there's the um, YouTube videos as well. There's a whole bunch of different channels. How much can you gain from that? Is it worth, is it worth just having a look at some of those and that they'll open my eyes to different skill you know techniques yeah or do i really need to go in and and is my best bang for buck paying someone for a one or two hour like technique workshop 
Yeah, I would probably recommend both. Like, if you pay someone for, like, if this is your sport and, like, you spend all this time, like, bikes aren't cheap, like, so you've already made an investment. Like, yeah. what's, like, a $100 extra to buy someone's online skills training program and, like, $200 extra to hire a skills coach for, like, two hours? So, like, yeah, yeah. what skills are ongoing? Like, uh, like once you have a skill, like, you need to continue to hone it, right? Yeah. So if skill is your limiter, you, like, you can get a coach to help identify what your limiter is um, in, you know, whether it's, like, cornering or, um, you know, picking a line or something like that. And then you yeah. can get one of those online programs to kind of help to train you. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Are there any you recommend? Um, uh, yeah, I have a coach that I recommend in the States. Uh, his company is called Take Aim Cycling, and yeah. um, I've done some work with him, and he's just great. I've sent riders to him, and Harlan Price, he was like a top-level 100-mile uh, racer in the States, yeah. and uh, he's, you know, decided that that's what he wants to focus on. Um, so that's, you know, uh, skills coaching in New Zealand. Um, I know World Cup downhill racer Bryn Dickerson, um, he's doing some skills coaching as well uh, once he heals his foot. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, yeah, and then um, as far as skills training programs, uh, there's a rider, Ryan Leach, who was, like, world-class, like, trials and free rider, and he now he has this company that does online skills coaching. So I had to yeah. look at those, and, um, yeah, it looks pretty cool. Okay, cool. I'll yeah. link to those in the in the description. Yeah. Um, that's, that's something I, I, I'd seen it pop up, and I was like, that's, you know, to, um, to purchase – straight off the you know for whatever and have it forever um i was like that if it was actually effective um would be a, a worthwhile investment um just a huge video library of of particular things you need to work on yeah well i mean if it can make you like 10 seconds faster in a race um or like you're already investing so much in the sport like like, oh, it, I mean, it's hard to say, like, just a little bit more, just a little bit more of an investment because yeah, you yeah. need to draw the line somewhere. But, you know, if skill's a limiter, like, yeah, like, don't get that brand new, like, flash carbon frame yeah. that, you know, that's, or, you know, I don't know, like, something silly, like, um, an upgrade for your bike. Spend that on, like, getting better because that'll, you'll have more fun than having a flash component. Oh. But... Actually, the other thing is um, we have a brake power meter, you know, that um, riders can use to see where they're braking and how hard they're braking. Yeah, um, so. I hear that's, uh, that's almost at the release stage. Yep, it is. Yeah, so um, I just showed Will um, some fancy things that we have going on just before we started the podcast. Um, yeah, so um, we'll talk about it soon. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so if you want to summarize to the, the listeners wanting to train for mountain biking, cross country in particular, we'll get into enduro and downhill stuff later. Um, what, what is it like, what, what am I trying, what should I focus on? Um, you know, when I'm looking at it, let's say just looking at it going, well, the start's really important and everything's really hard. Yeah, that's because that's how people are looking at it. Um, mm. But then, what's your your take on it and your recommendations? Yeah, my recommendation would be to kind of focus on developing your engine, um, yeah. and you know that might come uh, as you in like just spending less time going hard, yeah. right? Um, so, and then you can do it more. Um, so. Uh, that would be my first probably recommendation. My second recommendation would be to um, uh, not just try it in one race. Don't go out too hard. Okay. Just try and take it easy at the start and see what happens. Yeah. Start last, go into the single track last or something yeah. like that, yeah. and um, work your way through the race. Okay. That would be my second recommendation. And if um, you're really looking to get better, um, get a power meter and... Um, look at it with someone that kind of knows what they're doing yeah and now uh you've covered a lot of these sort of topics on your blog on mtbphd.com so people can jump over there um or your social medias and maybe flick you a message to ask 
in particular what would be most appropriate or when and where and how to do all these different kind of things, right? Yeah, definitely. Like there's some blog articles that you can mull through. Um, and then like I try and like post some like uh, informative Instagram posts, like instead of just like, uh, I don't know, just a photo of me biking, like no one really cares about. Like I try and make it something useful. So like uh, whether it's tire pressures or like pacing or uh, yeah, I saw like some uh, really interesting stuff on on there around pacing and suspension settings and and that, which is which is cool. I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm glad you offer that. Yeah, that's all free, you know. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, thanks for that, Matt. And Thank you. Yeah, I guess we will uh, touch base again next week. Yeah, I'll look forward to. It. I really like talking about mountain biking, so any chance that I can get. Um, talk about it and do this podcast is yeah just a good time all right sweet matt all right catch you later